19, 20 years old is not the time in life that you're known for being as the most selfless. Excuse me if you're that age. But um, it isn't a selfless time in your life. Um, and I was overseas in the military at the time. I was in Korea. And I just had this flashback to remember uh, that uh, the first of the month we got paid. And we would go through the pay line. And after you got your money from the sergeant who was, who was dispensing the money, um, you would turn to walk out of the tent, and there would be opportunity to donate uh, to other people's needs. Um, and the thing that was interesting is, one of the things that I remember is, over there there was a lot of guys that they, they would like um, have to rush home for compassionate leave. Um, and even though the government gives you the time to do that, <laughs> they don't necessarily give you a ticket to do that. Um, and I remember particularly um, one of the uh, one of the men um, wives was in a car accident, and um, he had two children at home, um, and so he got compassionate leave uh, to go, but was being held up because he couldn't get the the finances to do it. And what I thought was, I remember even at the time being impressed that as the guys filed by, almost everybody, without any hesitation, put money in there, even though most of us didn't know the guy. He wasn't in our unit. Um, because we had a sense of community. And, and that's what, the whole idea of bearing up one another's burden is about a sense of community. If you don't have a sense of community, you're not probably going to do it. Uh, but if you have a sense of community, then you feel for what others are feeling. And, and a very odd passage came to my mind when you're talking about bearing burdens. And that's in Matthew 27, 32. As they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear his cross. Now, Simon didn't sign up for this. And, and I'm going to guess, I was thinking about what it would be like to be Simon of Cyrene and you're asked to carry this cross. Mostly, Jews stayed away from crosses, if they could. This is not where you want to be. You do not want to be drawn into the limelight and have everybody see you carrying this cross up here. Um, you would not likely volunteer for this service. So he was pressed into service. And I'm going to guess that when he got there and put that cross down, he got away as quickly as he could. Uh, that's what I would do. And, and I'm hoping that that's not how we approach this lesson. It's like, you know what, I need to bear a few more burdens and get it over with so that I can get away from it. And I'm hoping that we don't feel with our brothers and sisters a sense of being pressed into service. I hope we feel a desire, an empathy, a connection, and a sense of community with one another. Galatians 6 that was read is an interesting passage, and I want us to note um, something about it, and that's why I wanted to read it again. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Notice verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. Notice verse 5, for each one will bear his own load. You know, in some versions, it's the, the word load is burden there. And so he's saying in the same context, bear each other's burdens, and we all have to bear our own burdens. Okay? So when you're reading that, you go, huh. Um, and there's a reason that those are both there. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go through it. But here's this admonition from the Apostle Paul uh, that we should bear one another's burden. That we need to have a sense of community with one another. Um, we're, not, we're not great at that. 
in my opinion, in America until tragedy comes. We're great at responding to tragedy. Really, we are. Uh, when there's a crisis, like, like down in New Orleans, you remember that? Everybody was looking for a place to bring stuff. People were taken off work to go down there and help people. Um, at a time like that, we, we seem to rise uh, to the top. I remember when we first went to Iraq and first went to Afghanistan, there were um, trucks where you could take stuff to send to the troops. I haven't seen very many of those. But in the beginning, we were all about it, weren't we? All about giving, all about helping. Um, so we, sent, we tend to be, when there is a pressing need, a tragedy, a disaster, we tend to be, we, we kind of, it stirs up that sense of community with us. Um, it's sad that it fades, but it does fade. Um, and you don't see much of it. Uh, after a while. So what are the burdens we're talking about? Well, the first time when he says, bear one another's burdens, this is a load that is unbearable. This is a burden that's unbearable. That's why we need to bear it with some people because the bear the burden is unbearable. It's, it's, it's too much to bear. So, um, and all of us have faced those. Um, I got to tell you that I've had some struggles in my life, some some burdens, even since I've been a child of God, even since I've been here, that I would have had difficulty carrying without some help, without somebody there alongside of me, kind of boosting me on and encouraging me. Um, so there's all different kinds of burdens. I want to talk about a couple here. Um, one is a spiritual burden, and that's what he's talking about in the initial context in chapter 6. But it's not all that he's talking about, and we'll see why that is in a minute. But in Galatians 6, 1, he says, if anyone is caught in any trespass. Now, what is that? How do you get caught in a sin? Um, he's not talking, you know, here's the thing about Scripture. Don and I have talked a lot about this. In Scripture, Christians don't go around sinning. I know that might offend somebody, um, but that's the reality. The reality is the New Testament assumes that you won't go out and deliberately sin because you're a Christian and because Christians don't want to do that. So that's why you're caught in a trespass. This is like it, it, it overwhelms you. You've been overwhelmed in a trespass. That situation arises where you get caught in something. You didn't expect it. You weren't planning it. You're still guilty because you give it, gave in to it. But you, you're you overwhelmed. I, I think anger is an example. Some of you have... Anybody ever lost their temper and they surprised themselves? Okay. Now, I'm, I'm not a... I used to have a horrible temper uh, before I was a Christian. Um, and I don't have a horrible temper anymore. I, I may have told this story before, but my wife doesn't like it, so I'll tell it again. Um, now, we were at Price Chopper, and uh, we were just doing our grocery shopping. It was a happy day, as I remember it. Um, I always like getting food. And uh, we were putting food in the, in the cart, and we were talking. And I stepped over to the side to do something. We were getting ready to check out. And my wife started putting stuff down on the conveyor belt thing. Um, and this guy took offense. He thought he was in front of her. He thought she was trying to jump in front of him. He turned around so fast, I can't even explain to you. He was right in her face screaming. Um, and I found out that my temper can be resurrected. Because before I knew it, I was between him and her. And I remember saying to the lady, yes. You do need to call security. <laughs> she said, do I need to call security? I said, yes, you do need to. <laughs> and what I was thinking was, you need to because he needs protection. Because <laughs> he's screaming at my wife. He's in her face. I felt like a, a big papa bear or something 
you know, and I know she's not my child, but I'm saying that it just, it overwhelmed me. It came over me, all right? Um, I say that to say I'm not sorry I stood up for her. I am sorry for the way I expressed it because I was caught in a trespass. I should have dealt with that better than I did, but I didn't. And, and I know my wife was surprised and disappointed. Not disappointed that I stood up for her, but disappointed because of the way I expressed it. Um, and, and so that's when I think of caught in a trespass, I think of that. Well, I didn't see that coming, and I didn't set out to do that. Um, but did I have the ability to do better than that? Yes, I did. I went with the easy route. The easy route is just give in to what you're feeling. Um, and that's what I did. Um, gratefully, I didn't give in completely to what I was thinking, feeling. Um, but all of us have been there. Everybody here has been caught in a trespass. Everyone here has struggled um, and has, has given in to something. Uh, they didn't intend to. They didn't set out to do it. But they found themselves doing it. Another area where I think we fall into that is with pride. With pride. Uh, we're pretty a, a pretty proud people. Um, as a nation uh, and, and as individuals. And you can know, you know your own weaknesses, your own struggles. And it's easy to get caught up in something. Gossip. Anybody in here ever get caught up in gossip? You don't have to raise your hand because I know you're all guilty. We've all gotten caught up in gossip, haven't we? Most of us don't set out to gossip. But somehow we find ourselves having gotten there. And we could go down through the list of things. We're not talking about renting a motel and having an affair. You're not caught up in anything there. That's something you chose to do. We're talking about that thing that overtakes you. And that's what this context is about. And he, he that's one kind of, of burden that we need to be able to help one another bear. Um, in the context here, sometimes we don't do that because of a spirit of haughtiness. Because sometimes when you mess up, it makes me feel a little better. Isn't that sad? But, you know, if you messed up and I didn't, then I'm kind of one up on you. Because that's the way we are as human beings. So that's why he, what he says after this that makes, makes it more sense. Um, but he's saying, you who are spiritual, you need to restore this person. And that word restore is, is to make healthy. Uh, bring them back to health um, spiritually. And uh, we'll talk about the, the, the attitude that we need to have in doing that. Uh, but, you know, that, that whole idea of of being, of restoring someone, rather than relishing the mistake they made, help them out of it. Help them get out. You know, I thought about this. Uh, um, I used to do this, and I may do it sometime in the future. And I used to do this rat trap that I had when I did youth rallies, and I talk about getting caught in sin, and I had this huge rat trap, and I used to thrust my hand into the rat trap at a certain point in the lesson. I always used to love to see the kids. They almost fall off the seat. I mean, it was great. Um, it also, just a little heads up, it hurts a lot. So you, you really want to be very careful. And the, and the other thing about it is it's hard to practice. So you get better at it. <laughs> you don't want to practice a lot. Um, but I used to thrust my hand in it. One of the things about it is it is possible with a with a. I, I found one trap that I had. I had different size ones that was actually big enough, and the the spring was strong enough that it was pretty hard to pull it off with your one hand while you had your other hand in it. And I would usually reach out like this, and somebody would just pull the spring back, and I pull my hand out. And I was thinking how sometimes when our brothers and sisters get caught, we're all about thinking how stupid it was to get caught. 
instead of helping them out of the trap. And that's what they really need. They need somebody that helps them out of the trap and helps them to heal. So that's one of the burdens that we have. Another burden is uh, the material bless- the burdens that we have. Galatians 6.6 6 says, The one who is taught the word is, sh- is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Um, in Acts chapter 4, 34 and 35, it talks about the early church in Jerusalem. There was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of lands or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each one as anyone had need. 1 Peter 4, verse 9, tells us to be hospitable. That is to share. To share what we have with one another without complaint. You know, there's somebody in here, and I'm not going to ask you to to reveal yourself, but I know there's somebody in here because I know human nature. There's somebody in here right now that's saying, well, that sure doesn't help happen a lot around here. You know, the nature of this is that it's often unknown. And sometimes the people in leadership know about hundreds of people who have helped other people in times like that, but it was done privately. If, if, uh, if Elroy's got a financial need and I help him privately, it doesn't embarrass him and it doesn't draw attention to me. So sometimes people choose to do it privately. That isn't to say it isn't being done. That's just to be say that the need is being met uh, very, very privately. And I can tell you that that has happened hundreds and hundreds of times in the time that I've been here. Multiple times a week, usually, I find, I hear of something someone has done for someone um, and many times in a very private way. Sometimes groups of us have gotten together in a private way and helped somebody with their car, with their rent, with whatever the need was. Um, So there's a lot of that that goes on, just like it did in in the first century. When we read about this, um, the very thing that there's a a, a contrast between Barnabas and and, uh, Ananias and Sapphira and Barnabas gives his money, lays at the apostles' feet, and it is distributed as necessary. Okay, um, Ananias and Sapphira want to make a show of this. Okay, um, and and so I think there's a lot of the private uh, that's going on, uh, and I see it and have experienced it uh, over and over and over uh, here in the body. Uh, but we need to be a people that share uh, with the material burden that people bear. And sometimes they're more than they can can hold. And emotional burdens. Now we who are strong, Romans 15, 1, ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. The the phrase, get over yourself, come to mind. Uh, Get past me and get on with helping others. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Sometimes just extending patience to somebody is is bearing a burden. Um, sometimes people just um, are just in, in great need of someone who will show patience towards them because of the things that they're dealing with. So who is it that bears this burden? Two things. Two, uh, there, you know, all of us need to be bearing burdens, but there's two things in Scripture that we've already read uh, that I think are interesting. And the first one is the spiritual ought to do it. Actually, some brother said that in a business meeting one time uh, when I was in another situation, and he said, "You know, yeah, you know, those the people who are really spiritual here ought to step up and and take care of that." I thought that was an odd thing to say. He ruled himself out of the spiritual. Uh, you people who are spiritual ought to handle that, um, ought to bear that burden. So who are the spiritual? You who are, are spiritual, restore such a one. So would the spiritual be people who don't get caught in trespasses ever? No, I don't think that's it. That'd be a small group, wouldn't it? Um, 
If you look in, in Galatians chapter 5, the chapter before this, the spiritual are those who walk by the Spirit. And who's supposed to walk by the Spirit? All of us. Okay? So Christians ought to do this. People who are really walking by the Spirit like they're supposed to. They ought to be bearing the burden of restoring people to Christ that have fallen because of their spiritual weakness. Now, there's two kinds of people in, that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians. He says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you're still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? In a congregation that I was in, we, uh, in, a, in a very short time, we baptized maybe uh, 50, 60 people. And uh, they, all these men came into the business meeting. Uh, none of them with much training in the Bible whatsoever. Uh, it changed the whole nature of the business meeting. Uh, we would be making decisions, and guys would say things that just would knock you over, you know? You know, you'd say, we're str this brother struggled three times and uh, and fallen, and we really need to help him. And somebody would say, well, why don't we just kick him out? And they were well-meaning. They were just young and just looking at it as the world would look at it. Uh, but, it, it, you know, I thought several times, you know, if we th if we call this for a vote, we might kick him out. Because there's enough people there saying, kick him out, and not very many people out there saying, let's bear with his brother. Because some were still very fleshly. They were young in the faith. But if we've grown in the faith at all, we should be spiritual men and women who are walking by the Spirit, and we have a responsibility to restore those who are struggling. And then he, sa he talks about the strong. I think if I'd have started this out by saying, could I see the hands of all the spiritual brethren? It would have been interesting. Um, I didn't do that. I'm not here to embarrass people. Uh, but it'd be sort of like if I said, I'd like uh, all the strong ones to meet at the front after service. Uh, we, we got a meeting of the strong. How many do you think we'd have up here? Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. You know what, If I'm, I, I just want to say this. If I'm strong or I'm spiritual, it's of no credit to me. It's all to the credit of God. So I don't need to, to be hesitant to say, God has blessed me so much He's given me strength spiritually. Or God's made me more spiritual in my walk than I used to be because that's God working. And that's a good thing. And that's to His glory. And if I've been a Christian for years and years and I say I'm still weak and unspiritual, then i got to ask myself, how strong is my commitment to God? That I haven't... That I'm still walking in the flesh when I've been indwelled by the Spirit for years? Read Galatians 5 if you if you wonder about that, because I think it's pretty pretty clear. So how do we bear one another's burdens? We do it with a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness is uh, underrated in our country. Uh, w gentleness sounds seems too much like weakness to people. But gentleness is a wonderful trait. And Jesus was a great man of God, and Jesus was gentle. He knew how to be gentle. He knew how to be strong. There were a couple times he knew how to be harsh, but he knew how to be gentle, especially those who, those who were weak and struggling. And when you approach people that have a burden and you approach them with a spirit of gentleness, it's amazing how receptive people can be. Even when you, res when you reach out to somebody that you think is struggling with sin and you know somebody might get defensive, but if you come with a humble and gentle spirit, You'll be amazed at how receptive people may be uh, to that attitude. And, that, and I like especially in Galatians 6, he uses that in regard to the person who 
who needs to be restored because when you've been caught in a trespass, the last thing you need to do is be beaten down by somebody because you slipped. Um, and he's saying to the, that to that effect, we're not here to beat each other down. We're actually here to give people a hand to get up. With a listening ear. How many of you know a good listener? Don't you like to be around that person? It's nice to be around a good listener. How many know somebody that doesn't listen at all, no matter how much you say? You flock to be around that person, don't you? Especially when you have a problem. You always want to go to somebody that doesn't listen at all. Um, Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Now you have to listen to you have to read that really carefully to understand it isn't how I speak that enables me to know how to respond it's how I listen that enables me to know how to respond so he's saying choose your words carefully so that you know how to respond so if I choose my words carefully and I'm listening to Marilyn and she's talking to me and I'm hearing what she's saying and I'm choosing my words carefully seasoned with salt and with grace then I'm a good listener. I have a good listening ear. James says, This you know, my beloved brethren. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. I know a lot of times when, when the elders sit down with somebody, one of the first things we do is say, "What do you? would you like to say something? And we listen. Um, it's interesting how many times and I know you've probably experienced this in your own life. How many times in telling somebody something, a problem, you start to see the solution? Just in telling them. All right? Um, a lot of times when somebody's in a problem, we think we perceive the problem and we jump right to the solution. Let's jump to the solution without knowing the story. You know? But if you're a good listener, if you approach people who have a burden that they're having trouble bearing with a listening ear it's amazing how much good can be accomplished with prayer James 5.16 says confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed the effective prayer of righteous man can accomplish much so the idea God has is that when you have, a, when you have sin in your life and especially if you sin against me you're going to come to me and you're going to talk to me, and instead of getting a defensive or a hurt or an angry attitude, you're going to get a prayer. I'm going to pray for you. Can you imagine if you did something, if somebody did something to you, and they come, you know, and you, you know how hard, because you've been there, how hard that is to, to approach that person and say, I messed up, and I did this. Can you imagine if they said, let me pray for you, brother? Let me pray for you. Let's pray together. How, how, how much that can lift that burden that you're bearing. And with encouragement. First Thessalonians 5, Therefore encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Then in verse in, in Hebrews 10, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, continue, consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Have you ever had that experience where somebody stimulates you in their conversation? Gets you wanting to do something when you weren't necessarily wanting to do it just because they're so encouraged? And, and they're so, they just have that ability to stir you up. Um, that always happened to me every year at youth rally time. I'd sit down with the youth rally list, everything that everyone did last year, and looking at all the stuff that we got to put together a theme and a budget, and we got to do this, and we got to sit at my desk. And then I get in a meeting, and people are like, I can do this, I can do that. Pretty soon you find yourself saying, Well, I can, I can cover this, I can handle that. And, and you get all excited because we stimulate each other. 
to do good things. And we need to really work at that. You know the other side of that? Boy, you can really tear people down that want to do something, can't you? By the things you say. You try this sometimes just for, you know, is when somebody's really excited about something, point out all the bad things that could happen with that plan. See how quickly they drop it. Even though it may have been a really good thing. Sometimes we don't mean to do that, but that's how we come across. Why should we bear one another's burden? He says, for each one will bear his own load. The word here is different. And it should be translated differently here, and it is. Uh, but in some versions it isn't. The word here is like the pack that the soldier carries. Each one has to carry his own pack. Different than the unbearable burden of, of verse 2. Uh, but what he's saying is, summing this thought up, everyone has to carry their own load. Everyone has to play a part. Everyone's needed in this whole process of burden bearing. Uh, we, we all have a part to play in this. So, why should we bear one another's build, uh, burden? Because it fulfills the law of Christ. Interesting, I mean, we're not, I think I know exactly what the law of Christ is, but it doesn't say what it is there. Um, I read one person that says he thinks it is the golden rule. Do unto others as they would do unto you. Okay, it, it actually would fit here. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think he's talking about love. Love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. Remember when Jesus talks about that as being uh, the second greatest commandment. Romans 13, 8 says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins importance of loving one another. I think the second reason is so that people will know that we're his disciples. Because Jesus was all about serving and bearing burdens. And when we show love for one another, when people see that we have that sense of community, when we step up and meet each other's needs, um, it, it speaks of Jesus to the world. They see that we identify ourselves with Him. John 13, 34, and 35, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. It's a sign. Bearing each other's burdens and showing that love for one another is a sign to people that we're associated with Christ. That we stand out. That we're different. First John says, whoever loves God must also love his brother. You know, in that context, he actually says that we can't love God unless we love our brother. We can't love God whom we haven't seen if we don't love our brother whom we have seen. If you can't even love each other, he says, what chance do you have to love me? So we need to be a people who bear burdens. Because that's what God calls us to do. Because that's who we are as His disciples. And because it fulfills God's will for His people. We're going to close with this verse in Acts chapter 2. The church in Jerusalem is just a, a magnetic thing. It just draws people, just this passage. And I keep being drawn back to it over the years. And when all of the people are together, the day of Pentecost, all the excitement of the Spirit falling uh, upon the apostles and the and speaking in languages that they hadn't learned, and the people are, uh, and Peter preaches his sermon, which is all about Jesus. It, it's, it's a great sermon about Jesus. Uh, and the people are pricked in their hearts, and they cry out, What must we do? In verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying be saved from this perverse generation so then those who had received his word were baptized and that day there was added about 3,000 souls and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers 
And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to the number day by day those who were being saved. It's a sense of community. And today, we're talking about community. And if you're not a child of God, we're not just inviting you to be baptized and have your sins washed away. We're inviting you to be baptized and have into Christ and into a relationship with Him because of your faith in Him and being added to His church, the body, and to have that sense of community with a community of believers that are striving to fulfill the law of Christ, to be the people of God, to be known as His disciples, a people who reaches out to the world but is known especially for bearing one another's burdens and caring for each other. If you're not a Christian, we urge you there's no better time than today. And if you are a Christian, I hope it just stimulates us to think about the need to be looking for the burdens around us that brothers and sisters are bearing and to help them to just step in and maybe just give a little lift uh, to help them to bear their burden more easily. Let's stand and sing.